Hi, good morning. Uh, so uh, we're ready to go with this uh, webinar. Uh, it's the last one of our lockdown series of webinars and it's the first one that I've done. So it will be um, an interesting neck hour coming up. I just hope that I've got it all technologically organized. If I haven't, I've always got Eugenie, who's our marketing officer, standing by in the wings, uh, ready to prompt me if anything goes wrong. Great. Um, so I'll just give a quick run through of what it is that we're going to talk about this morning. Uh, so I thought, uh, especially as most of you, I think, will be young people, uh, either with the company or perhaps looking to join the company. Uh, I'm going to talk about a little bit about uh, me and how I got into theatre, uh, what it was like being a teenager for me a long time ago uh, and discovering theatre and perhaps how some of that relates to what we do at BYMT. So it's a bit about me getting into the theatre. Uh, something about the shows that influenced me the most when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, going to university. Um, how my theatre career kind of started and what got me into producing shows. I'll talk a little, little bit about that. And then we'll go on and talk about uh, BYMT a bit, and I can answer questions about BYMT and how we operate, sort of a bit of stuff behind the scenes and that kind of thing, uh, before we go on to uh, do a Q&A for the last sort of 20 minutes or so, or however long it is. So that's the, that's the plan for this morning. Uh, so I think I'll just sort of like get underway. I might have a quick look in the chat and see what there is. There's hi from Neve and from Emma J. So uh, let's let's get underway and then we can stop halfway through. If people have got questions, you can put them in the Q and A as well, and I can I can pick them up from there as we go. Uh, right, just close the Q and A for the moment. Lovely. So uh, my name is John uh, John Bromwich. I'm the executive producer for BYMT. And I grew up in Birmingham, in a, a suburb of Birmingham, uh, back in the, basically in the 1960s. And uh, I came from a home which had no theatre involved at all. I'd never been to a theatre. Uh, in my sort of early years, my parents never went to the theatre. I knew nothing about it whatsoever. And uh, until I was about 13, so I knew it was, I had no connection with theatre at all. And also very little connection with music either because my parents didn't listen to much music at home. Uh, so my only real, the music that I knew and heard at home was largely the music that my older brother played uh, on his record player uh, in his bedroom. And that was largely kind of rock and roll. And um, so I so I went to school in, uh, in first of all, locally to primary school. And then I went to my secondary school, which was sort of in near the center of Birmingham. And it was while I was in Birmingham that I, at the, the, the school, in my secondary school, that uh, I got introduced to theatre. So it was one of those things which I didn't, when I was 11 and 12, I didn't really have any connection with it. And then when I was about 13 or 14, a particular teacher, and I'm sure this happens to lots of people, is that a particular pe uh, teacher who loves the theatre and is involved with it, um, arrives in your school and suddenly, inspires a whole generation of people to get involved in the industry or at least to, to love drama and plays and uh, and everything to do with with theatre so in my case uh, there's a fantastic teacher called Mike Parslew and he came along and he basically opened a drama club on a Friday afternoon and everybody like me who didn't want to go out and play sports on Friday afternoon ended up by going to the to the drama club and that's how I got involved and that was what really sort of inspired me really for the next sort of 50 years or so um, and so we did everything at school that you could possibly imagine. We, we bought, I mean, he was a great person at encouraging us to buy play scripts and we bought loads of play scripts. We read them, we selected bits of them, we rehearsed them at lunchtime and then we put them on after school. We did school plays and, uh, and really within about two or three years, I'd sort of got completely immersed in it. And indeed I've still got here some of the scripts that I bought um, at that time. So there's a um, John Osborne play and this man here, Alan Plater, 
um, who wrote a play called Close the Cold House Door, which is about the mining community uh, in, uh, in the Northeast. Um, so those sort of plays, there was a whole load of playwrights at the time who we were buying and experiencing and reading and going to the theatre to see. as Harold Pinter and David Story and Edward Bond, uh, Alan Plater, John Osborne. And uh, it, was a, it was a completely new world. It was a really eye-opening experience, I think, for all of us to be able to, um, to experience those, those, those sort of dramas. And we, uh, and so I started, first of all, I was doing little bits of, I did one or two tiny bits of acting, decided I didn't really like that very much. So I started doing some stage management and uh, we created a number of shows at school. And one of them, which I'm sure lots of you will know, uh, is in fact, um, of course, Oh What a Lovely War. And i share the screen with you. That was it. And that is my copy of Oh What a Lovely War from uh, 1969, I think. And there you are, John Bromwich, stage manager, not to be taken away. And um, the great thing is that it wasn't taken away. And there it is. And that's my 50 year old copy of Oh What a Lovely War. Um, so that's, that was how I sort of started at school reading all those plays and putting putting shows on and also we were encouraged by our teachers to go and see lots of shows at the Birmingham Rep and so I spent a long time at the Rep sort of seeing almost everything that went through the theatre there, Shakespeare, Chekhov, um, but also lots of new plays as well so I was sort of grounded in theatre between the ages of 16, 17 and 18 going to see as much as I possibly could uh, and absolutely loved it, it was a fantastic experience. I think the other thing that was a real influence at the time was that outside in the wider world there were amazing things happening uh, all the time throughout the sort of late 1960s and into the 1970s um, and in particular I suppose there's a lot of political activity going on there's sort of a social revolution going on we were even as teenagers in Birmingham felt really connected to a lot of the big sort of campaigns that were happening in various places and um, we were often watching some really kind of extraordinary stuff happening on our TV screens and uh, to give you an idea of what was happening at the time um, I can probably just share this again um, yeah so here was this was probably oh this picture of me. So that's me, aged 17, I think, on the left with the hair and the Doctor Who scarf. And that's my brother on the right, uh, who was the rock and roll fan, and my father behind, and our family camper van. So that's, uh, that's kind of around about 1970, I think, 71. Uh, so, but what was happening outside in the, main, in the world was just extraordinary. And this is probably one of the most famous photographs of the Vietnam War, which kind of came straight into our, uh, into our uh, living rooms and on and the newspapers. And that's the girl who was photographed having just all had all her clothes burnt off by napalm. And I can't tell you what the sensation was for all of us in experiencing that kind of thing happening uh, around us. And that's why we were so, well, theatre became sort of bound up with politics um, at the same time. This was the, uh, these were the, the uh, scenes on the Berkeley University campus in the States with the National Guard uh, attacking students there. That's one of them who'd been shot. Uh, in Prague, there was an extraordinary invasion of uh, Czechoslovakia by the, by the Russians. And so this, the, the tanks were arriving, students were um, fighting the tanks effectively. And horrendously, this was Jan Palak who burnt himself to death in, in that, um, during that period in protest at the Russian invasion. In Northern Ireland, that also was changing rapidly. There, was, there were marches going on demanding uh, democracy in Northern Ireland and also civil rights for the nationalist community. And British soldiers were suddenly on the streets of Northern Ireland. This is in the bog side in, um, in Derry. And you can just see the woman in the corner there sort of uh, cowering away from the British army going through the bog side streets. So there's a lot going on. This was uh, marches in London uh, uh, against Vietnam and the American involvement in Vietnam 
and again people being arrested by the police so there was a huge amount going on in the um in the world outside and that's what um i think really uh, yeah it's kind of um it was a it was a very exciting time and somehow it also seemed to connect to the theatre as well so we i think we were all kind of really moved by what was happening and that sort of remained with me for quite a long time it was interesting that uh, when we later on in bymt we were able to create a show which is sort of based around uh, protest as well and that was a show which actually we uh, became according to brian hall we actually uh, created a song and put it out yesterday i think which eugenie will put the link up for in a minute um okay so uh i was at school doing all this theater i had a fantastic chance to be able to go and create shows not only in birmingham but also we went to uh germany with a school play took that on tour and we also went to the edinburgh festival as well so before i'd left school and went to university in fact i ended up by doing quite a lot of touring which was uh, my first experience of it and it was also the first time really i've been outside outside of birmingham we uh and from there really i then went on to to university went to bristol and spent a long time doing a lot of uh, a lot of theatre there. I was uh, partly involved in putting together shows going out on tour from from university, and then also uh, created um, went, went off with Edinburgh uh, Reunions, Bristol Reunions, going to the Edinburgh Festival. So there was a lot. Uh, there was a lot happening there. So effectively, all my the all the influences on me came from school and university in, in uh, getting into theatre so that's where we that's where i kind of got involved most of all um there were a number of shows as well which uh i saw at that time and i'm just going to share a couple of them with you as well i hope you can hope you can see this so the first show which really excited me i suppose outside of birmingham was being taken to see a midsummer night's dream and uh that was again a totally life-changing experience i should be able to share this with you i hope uh right. 55 years later peter brooks production of a midsummer night's dream provided exactly that i'll have a minute wonder you the aim was to appeal to your imagination through a lively, humorous contact between stage and audience, and for that, light was essential. Night in the forest must be conjured up lightly and amusingly, so the image of darkness must be swept out, swept the image of darkness here, I said, well, the first thing is a white box. We realised that the old tradition that had died so hard that the Midsummer Night's Dream of all plays is about night, and so night has to be shown on stage, could be dispensed with. Space Yeah! Peter Brook encouraged directors and actors to return to the text, to find that the meanings are open, that there isn't one solution to the stage of Shakespeare's plays, and to exploit what we might call the theatreness of theatre. And I'll play a little clip from the from the next one as well. Um, I think. Sweet 
so let's just see if I can get back. So um, I, I basically travelled from Birmingham down to London to see to see the show, and it was yeah it absolutely changed my whole view of theatre and what it was what it was about. I remember we arrived at four o'clock in the morning and uh, then queued the whole day to try and get tickets for, uh, for the show outside the Aldrich Theatre. And I think I got tickets at 7.25. I can remember exactly the seat I sat in in the second row of the stalls. And this show just sort of overpowered me completely. So that was, um, I think, uh, a really life-changing experience in terms of theatre. Um, the, and the other show that I remember going to see at about the same time was produced by a Polish company um, and run by a director called Tadeusz Kantor. And this uh, again introduced me to a kind of theatre I'd never seen before, including all sorts of puppetry and, uh, and ways of expressing sort of uh, non-realistic ways of producing theatre. And I can remember again going to this uh, tiny little theatre in a church, created in a church at the Edinburgh Festival. Uh, see if I can actually find it. And And obviously, that's the, there's a whole show there that um, you can uh, uh, you can see on um, on video if you get a chance. Uh, look it up on Google. It's called Dead Class, and it toured for probably about twelve or fifteen years altogether as part of Tadeusz Cantor's uh, company. So this was uh, this was changing my view completely of what what theatre could be about, and uh, and I think ever since then I've retained a sort of interest in in mime and puppetry and other ways of doing theatre other than just the box set and, uh, uh, and um, the standard repertoire of plays. Um, so I went to Bristol University and spent three years there, did lots of work, as I said, with all those sort of various companies. And then I was very lucky in that when I left, I got a job almost immediately with the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and went there doing stage management and working backstage on the crew. And it was an incredibly busy year. And I just learned so much by working backstage and watching what was happening and being involved in, in some really extraordinary productions, which were coming down from Stratford and we were getting them in one after another. So sometimes we'd be working for three, four, five days. Well, certainly three or four days without sleep at all getting getting shows in it's the kind of thing you can't do now for health and safety reasons but at the time uh, we that that's the way that the shows went into mostly into the aldrich theater in in london and i learned a huge amount about staging lighting sound watching other people flying shows um and also how to stack up one show on top of another backstage so there was a lot of um experience i gained very rapidly in terms of actually how to um, look after shows backstage and that proved a tremendous help in years to come and uh, particularly I think in understanding uh, you know the kind of things that you can do in theatre and how you can always sort of get your way out of difficult situations if you're just thinking slightly ahead as to as to um, uh, resolving the, the sort of problems that you might get both technically and in terms of producing 
and putting shows on generally. So it was, it was kind of massively helpful uh, experience. I then went from the Royal Shakespeare Company to Derby Playhouse. I spent a year there getting my equity card, doing a lot of stage management there, and then also doing some directing. Uh, so I directed a couple of shows in the studio there. And then I came to London and I was sort of wanted to become a, uh, a director. And I spent a number of years sort of uh, doing fringe shows and things. And then slowly, I suppose, I understood that probably I wasn't going to be able to, um, uh, I wasn't going to be able to uh, make it as a director. Partly, I think I just understood that I didn't really have the, um, I didn't have the, uh, experience and probably the talent to be a director but a lot of other things I did want to do and so I started touring uh, initially for Bill Kenwright um, quite a lot and that was a uh, again that was about eight or nine years worth of touring gave me a lot of experience in backstage work putting shows on lighting shows uh, it also led to a, a lifelong love of uh, Belfast, actually, because I found that I was touring a lot of shows into the Grand Opera House in, in Belfast, and they uh, and, and I began to get to know people there, began to understand what it was, what the theatre was like, and all the people who worked in the theatre, and I started to get uh, get a I said, get a, an understanding of what was happening in Ireland, sort of more generally, I guess. Uh, it, it was right in the middle of the Troubles. There were bombs going off all over the place. I had a company of people to look after. And, uh, and I had some really extraordinary experiences, sometimes going down the Falls Road uh, with people from the theatre and suddenly feeling I'm sort of on the other side of things. So that was, that was uh, a really good experience. And also what it meant was that the whole touring thing meant that I get, got to know I would think probably two thirds of all the theatres in the country, the number one touring theatres, the mid-scale theatres. So by the time uh, I was getting to the point where I was starting to produce work myself, I think I probably played pretty well all the number one houses from Aberdeen down to, down to Plymouth altogether. So that was, that was also uh, a, a, good, a good learning experience for when I then started producing my own shows. So in 1985, I think I met Chris Hayes, who was the artistic director of the Theatre Royal in Plymouth, and we started producing our own shows. And the, it, I don't know how we really started. We just sort of sat in a room and said, we're theatre producers, let's put on a show. So that's, that's, how it, how, that's how it began, really. We did um, one production at the Ludlow Festival, put on a production of Romeo and Juliet, and uh, had a really great success with that. It was fantastic. It was also the first time that I'd managed to cast somebody who really brought people into the theatre, a little box office attraction. Uh, somebody who probably a lot of you won't have heard of, but a, so, uh, an actress called Mandy Rice Davis. And I'd seen Mandy in a show at the Arts Theatre. She was, she was an actress, um, but she had also been involved in a, in a huge scandal back in 1963 when I was a child, um, and which, had brought, which effectively brought down the Conservative government uh, of, of the time. And um, she, she coined a famous phrase called, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Uh, in relation to some activities which were going on at the time, which you probably can't talk about on uh, on a webinar. Uh, so, uh, and Mandy, uh, she was an unusual casting for the for the role of Lady Capulet in Romeo and Juliet. But suddenly, we had a massive box office hit on our hands. People came in from all over the surrounding area around Ludlow to see it. We sold every ticket in the uh, in the castle production. And um, I sort of suddenly began to realise that if you get the right casting, you can do really well on, uh, on theatre shows. So we, Chris and I then spent the next six or seven years uh, working on a number of show productions and um, probably the most, um, uh, the, the one I enjoyed most, I think, was To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, which we produced with Alan Doby playing the, the lead role of the lawyer Atticus. And um, we, we took that show on tour, I think for a total of 52 weeks. It was almost exactly a year. Uh, and I might even have a few 
might even have a few uh, photos of it if I can find them. Uh, oh, that was a picture of the Birmingham Arts Lab that, uh, which I meant to talk to you about, which again was a sort of fringe theatre in Birmingham, which I absolutely loved performing at and playing at. Um, it was one of the few times I've actually been in a show myself, and uh, it was a transcript of the Oz trial papers. And this arts lab was the kind of fringe theatre which sort of started loads of people working in, in the industry at that time. It's a bit, probably a bit difficult to see this, but it was, this is a representation, a cartoon representation of what went on in the building. Um, there were quite a lot of people who then became well known, like David Hare and David Edgar, the playwrights, uh, were there doing things. You can see there's a little theatre and cinema at the top there and there was a tie-dye printing press in the tie-dye t-shirt printing press in the basement and you can just about see here there were people actually slept underneath the rafters from one day to another um, just because people didn't want to leave the theatre it was it was such an exciting place to do, be it was brilliant. Um, anyway just jumping on a bit so back to where we Chris and I started producing shows. This was our first show, which I think we did at the King's Head in Islington. And then we produced Kill a Mockingbird, which, which took up in all, I think, about two years of my life. It was a fantastic production. And uh, we toured it, as I say, to pretty well every, every country, every, sorry, every town in the country. Um, and this, these were the cast productions. Great days, actually, when these are sort of 10 by 8 prints. Right. So uh, just, yeah, so just talking about some of the shows that we did, we took shows all over the country and uh, it was a, it was a, a really great experience. Uh, after we run the company for about seven or eight years, Chris went to RADA to teach there and I carried on working in the theatre, uh, working, uh, doing consultancy work, doing general management. And for some time, uh, I was also working with a Japanese company called Susumu Productions. And we put on one of Lindsay Kemp's, probably one of Lindsay Kemp's best shows, I thought, um, Varieté at the Hackney Empire. And um, uh, that was a show which later on I was able to get the rights for to be able to put on as a show with, um, uh, with uh, BYMT. Uh, so we can talk about, a little bit about that later. Um, so that was so that was my sort of producing career up until around about sort of uh, just 2001, 2002. I then got involved in youth theatre and started uh, working on youth theatre shows. And then in 2003, we set up uh, Youth Music Theatre UK, which became BYMT. So that was my sort of trajectory going from basically from producing professional shows into producing uh, the uh, youth theatre shows, which is what, what the company is at the moment. So just a little bit about, about the company. We started in 2003. Uh, we had almost nothing to start, start the company with. We started it off with a, um, we started it off with, I think, a 50 pound printer and a free office in Piccadilly. And we began to, uh, we began to uh, audition almost immediately for, uh, for young people. We started with a company of, uh, I think, four associate directors. There was me, there was Kath Berninson, who was a director, Vernon Mound, who was an opera director and also worked with young people. And there was a, uh, another director called Sid Ralph. So the three, di three associate directors who directed shows and me producing the, producing the work. It was, uh, it was a really exciting time. We just loved uh, every moment of the, um, we loved every moment of the uh, early days. And within about two years, I think we'd got to the point where we were producing, uh, we were producing about eight shows seven to eight shows a year, something like that. And the Arts Council then came in and supported us with the first, uh, first tranche of funding, I think in 2005, 2006. And we then took the company up to the Edinburgh Festival and did a wonderful piece called Goblin Market, which we're planning to redo again this year. And that was uh, a piece created by, by, written by Connor Mitchell. 
So the, so the company started uh, in a very, uh, so there was no real planning to it, I don't think. We just sort of said, we're going to start this company and, uh, and, and it took off really quickly. And the fact the Arts Council came in and supported it so early on meant that we got established really, really fast. The, the basic policies that we decided to go for uh, were driven, I think, by by partly by some of the things that I've experienced sort of growing up in my teenage years. It was about doing new work rather than doing repertoire. It was about creating work through experimentation where we could and, and uh, doing devising and improvising. So um, those were the sort of driving, driving forces behind it. The other things that were really important to us, as I think when we started the company, was that we have very ethical policies, uh, very ethical policies on pastoral care, and also that we really try to avoid one of the one of the things which you do find in youth theatre sometimes is that there tends to be sort of like quite a lot of favouritism. And so one of the reasons that we audition people every single year anew is in order that one doesn't build up those sort of particular connections with one group of young people or another group of young people. And so that avoids the favouritism that, that uh, sometimes sort of bedevils youth theatre. Um, we also wanted it to be uh, non-London centric. So it's really important to us that we had pe young people coming in from all over the country, from, uh, from Scotland and Northern Ireland and from, uh, from Ireland as well. And uh, so we started auditioning almost straight away in, in uh, right the way across the whole of, uh, whole of the UK. And that was, I think it was a really good decision to make. It meant that we had a real national feel to the company and it meant that young people could actually meet lots of other young people from around the country at the same time. So those were some of the sort of guiding principles of uh, BYMT or YMT UK when we started. Um, I suppose one of, the, one of the most important things is the kind of programming side of, uh, of the company. How do we program? I quite often get asked uh, what the decision making process is about putting putting new shows on and uh, the short answer is that there isn't there isn't one answer to it it's a mix of different uh, different ideas and thoughts that go into into each year spend quite a lot of time reading material uh, looking at uh, other artists work seeing seeing what there is what people are doing quite like people writing in and saying I'm doing this do you want to come have a look and see see my show so I don't see a certain amount of theatre just in order to try and keep up with what's going on uh, I have some shows which are produced uh, with BYMT which go right the way back to when I was at school myself so I mean or, uh, or at university so I've had scripts and books would have been sitting there waiting for some sort of development for them and suddenly the moment came and that felt like the right year and I think we, d we did shows like um, uh, Le Taboo which was uh, a French piece which we're hopefully going to do again next year and that had, I'd had that book sitting there for sort of 40 years on my bookshelf which was um, which was fantastic and uh, we also did um, we've also done quite a lot of other shows which we've developed from devising uh, new work over the over the years um, in fact, uh, think if I think back recently to plays like uh, productions like Wild, which we did in Plymouth, uh, again, that whole experience of young people creating and making new work is, is I think, really, really important. So, um, uh, so we, we, we put the shows together, we put the programme together, and build it up over a period of time. So perhaps when we're looking at 2021, uh, although we've got all the problems of COVID and the rest of it to kind of deal with, looking ahead to those productions, um, there'll be a mixture of work which we've been planning for some time and it's sort of the moments come, but also trying to be opportunistic about uh, the different um, trying to be opportunistic about new ideas so suddenly going and seeing something and feeling that we can put this into the program late on so what you'll probably find is that the program that we produce for 2021 will be half of it will be in place now we're around about now and the other half of it will come on stream during the course of the next five or six five or six months sometimes we're responding also to the number of young people who are auditioning for us 
So what may happen is if we get a large number of people auditioning, we might increase the number of shows. Um, and equally, there will be times when we, uh, when either we sort of pull back slightly if we haven't got as many people auditioning, or what we might do is just kind of have split companies in one way. So I mean, certainly one year we took a group of come a group to the Edinburgh Festival and we split the company between two different groups putting on two different shows. So it's quite flexible, and there are lots of there are always lots of new ideas uh, coming forward. Uh, right. One of the things I think is, is also the reason I love working for the company um, is that actually you can do things with this level of youth theatre that you can't do in professional theatre and that makes a, that makes a kind of massive difference. Um, uh, it's partly because of the scale of the company, partly because there's the ability to commission work which you can't do in the professional theatre in quite the same kind of way unless you're really heavily funded. And uh, partly because there isn't the need to have something which is going to necessarily take a huge amount of money at the box office. So what that means is that it actually gives you a massive amount of flexibility. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to sell more than 100 tickets or 200 tickets per show. We might only do three or four performances. That's a, a massive kind of advantage in terms of giving us flexibility for the for the work we want to do, and I think that's why some of the work becomes so exciting because that you haven't got that commercial commercial pressure. Um, right, um, that I think kind of covers a lot of the things I just wanted to say about theatre and how I got into it and the sort of things that we do. Um, so what I might do is just have a quick look at the. Q and A. See if we've got any questions at all. Uh, let's have a look. Anything in the chat? Uh, so um, I'm got any questions at the moment. So let me just talk a little bit about Brian Hoare. I think I mentioned this earlier on. Um, so we produced a show uh, called According to Brian Hoare. We started it. I think in 2009 and uh, it started as a summer camp as a typical uh, route that we might take uh, in order to create new pieces of theatre. Uh, so we, we did a summer camp on it to begin with. Uh, Eddie Latter, who was the director on it, went to see Brian, who at that time was camping outside Parliament uh, in a tent with another, probably another 200 people also in tents. Uh, campaigning against uh, Britain's involvement in the Iraq war. And uh, Eddie went and got some quotes from Brian and learned a little bit about the backstory of Brian and how he had left uh, Redditch in, in Worcestershire and come to London and sort of started this whole, um, this, this whole campaign. Uh, we then took the, uh, some of the tapes that uh, we made with Brian on the outside parliament took them down and ran a one week summer camp course, which developed the ideas which then later became a show. So it's an indication of the way in which we can layer up a production over several years. So possibly four or five or six years. We did the summer camp, then we took the production, uh, to, then we took the production to Plymouth and did another two weeks work on it. Uh, Eddie was directing it and it turned into uh, a, a really exciting piece of protest theatre, I think. It, uh, and in fact, I remember Eddie at the end of it, we had all the placards and we came back from Plymouth and I can remember us walking through Paddington Station with all the placards still held up having, having done the show. So it was, you know, that was a kind of really powerful start to it. We then had brought in another director to, to help develop it and a composer and a writer, James Atherton and Sarah Nelson came in to James to write the music. And so the next time we did it, we took it up to Yorkshire and did another two to three weeks development of, of it up there. And the piece got richer and deeper and more exciting to work on, I guess. Uh, it, but the thing about it is it always remained a piece of raw theater. It was never too well crafted. It had little faults and bumps in it and things, but it was this, the level of commitment of the young people and the music made it 
uh, one of the most exciting pieces I think we've produced in the, in the last 17 or 18 years. So, uh, and then we brought it to London to the Riverside Studios. And again, with this, this time we changed the actual setting of it. So instead of having it kind of end on uh, as a piece of theater, we developed the whole place into a tented encampment and the audience came in and sat around either in tents or beside tents with members of the cast. So that was, again, changed the whole dynamic of the piece. It was a, a wonderful experience. And we took that through, got a question come in from Emma Jay, I'll pick that up in a minute. Um, I got, uh, we, we took, the, um, we took the, the, the piece into Riverside Studios. And then this year we managed to bring the cast back together again to do a, um, uh, to do a, a video version of it as a result of, of COVID. So, uh, and that was launched yesterday. So I think Eugenie is going to put up that in the, in the chat. Uh, in fact, she has put it up in the chat, which is great. So if you want to go and have a look at that, you will see then how this kind of, what started as a piece of experimental theatre, I guess, an improvised piece turned into something which is now a full scale show. The plan is that having done it once uh, as a BYMT show, we're going to bring the company back next year to do a concert version of it. They, of course, are now sort of six years older. And then we're going to hopefully do a professional production in another four or five years time. So having a long sort of um, uh, a, a long journey on that show. And that's not untypical of the way that BYMT works. So we might start a piece in a small way and then build it up over several years in different production styles, things like that. Great. Um, so I've got a question from Emma. Is it harder to get into the theatre industry nowadays? Um, let me pour a bit of water and I'll think about that. Is it harder? Mm. I think what is true is that there are far more people probably trying to get into the industry than there were when I started. So I think I was sort of, from our school, I was one of a, a handful of people um, who went into the theatre and the, and, the, and the industry was relatively small. Nowadays, there are a, a, a huge number of opportunities for training. I think, I, I think I'm right in saying that something like at any one time, there's something like 8,000 people training to go into the industry across drama schools, universities, um, and BTEC courses of various kinds. So there's a lot of people aiming to get in there. The number of jobs has increased, I think, uh, and there's more and different types of jobs, especially with online work and more film and TV work. But the, work, the amount of work in the theatre has probably increased a bit because of there being bigger shows in the West End. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure it's harder because the industry is more difficult, but I, I do think that the numbers coming into the industry are huge. So you've got to bear in mind that uh, the, the kind of core industry hasn't increased that, that much, I don't think, in terms of actors on stage. There are lots of other things which have grown. So actors can get work um, outside of the theatre more possibly than they used to when I started in the industry. Um, so I, I'm not sure it's harder. I think there are more routes in, but the amount of work may not have increased that much on stage anyway. I'm not sure if that, if that helps, Emma. Uh, it's the other thing I think which has changed in the industry is that drama schools have become more important. So whereas when I started, there were a small handful of drama schools and it was, it was very difficult to get into them. But on the other hand, I think what happened is a lot of people managed to get into the, into the industry in other ways. So if you didn't get into drama school, you could still apply to get um, a technical ASM job in a theater. And if you managed to do that, then you didn't need to get any training and you just sort of like started. And that was uh, the way that I think most people probably started in the industry then. Nowadays, getting into drama school or getting some kind of qualification has become more important. 
even though you don't need to be an equity member to, to get in. When I started, you had to have an equity card to get into, into a job in the theatre. And there were a very limited number which were actually given away each year. So I think when I got into Derby Playhouse and got my equity card there, I was one of only two people who got, got that opportunity that year in, uh, at that theatre. Uh, nowadays, anybody can, can uh, go and work in the theatre if you get a job. You don't need to have a union card to be able to do it. So that, that's changed as well. Um, but I, generally speaking, I would say that, all the, as I say, there are more opportunities uh, to get into the industry, more training opportunities, but possibly uh, not the number of jobs that you would need to justify the number of people who are training. Um, I mean, the training question is a really difficult one. I know lots of people ask, is it better to go into the theatre via drama school or is it better to go to university? Uh, and I think the answer to that question is it depends totally on your personality, what you want to do, uh, what areas of the industry you're interested in, and uh, possibly also, you know, what, what you're, how interested you are in the academic side of, uh, of the theatre. If you, if you're really keen on on directing, producing, acting as well, but you may find then that you're better going off to university. Um, if you're absolutely convinced, 100% convinced, or not even 100%, 120% convinced, convinced that you want to be in a show in the West End, then probably your best route is to go to drama school. Um, th there are some really key differences, I think, in the two. Uh, but no, one is not better than the other, they're just different. Um, so one of the things that you get in drama school is that you certainly have a phenomenal uh, discipline which is imposed upon you, and which you need to kind of accept. And so, for instance, if you go to drama school and you turn up late and you don't turn up, then you're out. It's as simple as that. If you go to university, well, you can get up at 10 o'clock in the morning and miss a lecture and it doesn't matter too much. So I think there's a sort of, there's a sort of discipline thing. University, you have to be more self-disciplined, uh, but sometimes there are more opportunities as well. So certainly when I was at university, and I think it's still the same really at, at places like Bristol, that uh, you've got the opportunity, the Drama Society, the Opera Society, the Bristol Reunions, all those other things which are going on, uh, which you don't necessarily get at drama school. So it, the, the difficulty of getting into the industry varies depending on what, where you want to end up really. If you want to end up being in a West End show, then you're probably, as I say, probably better off going and getting the, the drama school training if you can get in there. Uh, if you want to have a sort of slightly wider ranging trajectory, then you could easily go to, to university. Um, the other thing I think is worth saying is that it's, you can certainly go to university and then go on to drama school afterwards. And a lot of people uh, do that very successfully. So as an example, actually, Alex Hammond, who did the first of these webinars, uh, went to Leeds University, I think, uh, did, uh, I think he did drama there. Leeds has got a fantastic reputation for its kind of um, physical theatre element of, uh, of its course. Um, but it doesn't train you how to be a, a, an actor in Wicked. Um, so, but you can then, once you've completed your university, you can then go off to um, you can go off to drama school. And what Alex did was go to the Royal Academy of Music and do the uh, MA in musical theatre. So um, by combining the two, you get the best of both worlds in some ways. If you're absolutely convinced you want to be a dancer in a show, then you know there are places like Lanes, um, which are probably some of the best sort of dance schools that you can get to for doing commercial dance. Uh, so that's if you're looking for a route into dancing in West End shows, dancing in um, TV, and uh, and and also doing cruise shows, which has become a massive industry in the last few years, up until COVID, of course. But prior to that. The, the cruise industry has exploded with um, massive shows, some of them costing, you know, 10, 15 million pounds to put on, and they are demanding more and more really top quality dancers and uh, musical theatre performers. So um, 
yeah i think that's i wouldn't yes as i think generally speaking it's not harder to get in uh, i think there's more opportunities uh but uh, the, the core work in the West End probably uh, hasn't increased that much in terms of numbers. Good. Uh, right. We've got anybody else. Kaylee asks, can you tell me more about the Creative Trainee Scheme? Yes, I can. Um, so the Creative Trainee Scheme at BYMT, we, we started this again right at the very beginning of the company. And we wanted to give opportunities for young people who were at college or university and uh, in probably in their third year to get involved in the company and to offer their skills but also to get useful contacts um, and so we set something up called the creative trainee scheme so basically it's mostly for designers and for musical directors who are second or third year at uh, conservatoire university and who want to get some experience working alongside professionals. So, I mean, the, the most obvious one is somebody who say has done a, a composition course or something at, at um, a conservatoire. And very often the conservatoires, I mean, I think there's a good example is like Guildhall, where you might do quite a lot of classical music, but if you love musical theater, then you probably won't get much to do much of that at, um, at, uh, at Guildhall but you can then do a, a creative trainee scheme with us. And that gives you the opportunity to work alongside a professional MD, get experience, and also very often get fantastic contacts because the people you're working with are the sort of people who are going to go on and give you work afterwards. So I can think of a lot of people who've been on the creative trainee scheme who when they've finished have then been offered paid work by the professionals that they've been working been working with. Uh, the creative trainee scheme is something you apply for. And what we do is we we basically basically we give you a small amount of money to sort of look after yourself, um, uh, cover your expenses, we cover the travel and we cover the accommodation. So it's a sort of halfway house, a kind of work experience for people who've gone through um, conservatoire training. Great. Neve, if you wanted to do the uni then drama school route, do you think it's essential to study something theatre related at uni before drama school or would it be okay to study something completely different such as science? And the answer to that is yes, it's absolutely fine to study something like science. Uh, and I think, I mean, I know quite a few people who've done other courses of various kinds and have then gone, in, gone into a theatre. So I think it's... Um, all, everything that you do at university contributes in some way to what you do in the theatre. You will always find that there are connections of various kinds. And of course, famously, lots of people have done uh, medical courses, trained as doctors, and then gone into theatre as well. Probably Jonathan Miller was the most famous. But, but also, I mean, we have uh, one of our practitioners uh, trained as a GP, uh, did a medical course. She was a GP for about 10 years. And then she changed over and decided to do theatre and now she directs shows for us and we'll be directing one next year, I think. So I think do what you want to do at university. You know, if you're really good at biology, do biology. If you work, then still want to go into theatre, go and do your training at a, a, a postgraduate level. But the other thing about university, of course, is that you can keep on doing theatre and music even while you're doing biology because there are so many... Uh, societies that you can get involved with and they're very often doing stuff which is kind of a bit different and a bit wacky and and that gives you another kind of view of theatre so definitely I would um, you know do your science course and then decide whether you want to go and do some some uh, theatre as well. Danielle will you be holding auditions this year for the 2021 summer shows or are you putting on the 2020 shows? So uh, this is all COVID related, obviously. Uh, the answer to that is that we're going to do both. Um, so the plan is that at, we still want to get on our 2020 shows. We want to make those happen. We want to offer the young people who've been in them, who've been cast into them, the opportunity to do them. Uh, come hell or high water, the plan is to, to get the 2020 shows on. 
and then to go ahead and have auditions as well for the uh, 2021 season. So we have a 2021 season half lined up. Uh, there are shows which will be going up on the website fairly soon and people will be able to do both shows. That's the, that's the plan at the moment. This is from Maya, I think. Do you think studying at a university before going into the industry would leave you better off? Hmm. Interesting. Um, if you mean better off financially, um, uh, it, it, it might give you other options, I guess. How you how you make your way in, in the industry um, over the course of a career is is a difficult question to answer. Quite a lot of people go into the industry and spend probably between seven to 12 years working as an actor and then they sort of move off into into other things sometimes they go into teaching sometimes they go into um something completely completely different um set up their own businesses go into marketing and things like that um so i think the more experience you've got in lots of different areas the 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 better off you are sometimes that's also because if you want to build a career in the in the theater industry you need to have um, other things that you can do at the same time because you're not going to be working all the time. So I know actors, and I know Alex Hammond, again, if you go back to his, his webinar, I think he's got 17 things that he does other than acting. Uh, so it's always worth having those things that you can, you can rely on um, for when you're actually not on stage. And actually, I know actors who run small property development companies because it kind of fits quite well. If you manage to buy somewhere, uh, and then you can do it up and set it on again. So I knew a number of actors who did that as well as actually, um, as well as actually having a, a long career in, uh, in acting. Um, yes, I mean, the, uh, uh, the truth is you don't go into the theatre industry expecting to make a fortune and very, very few people do. So the majority of people are on relatively low, relatively low incomes, I would say. Uh, so having other things that you can do is always is always worthwhile. Um, great. So I think can't see any other questions coming in at the moment. Um, yeah, I think we've gone through all the questions. Good. Um, so I will. I think I'll leave it there if we haven't got anything else. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, lots of people at the auditions when we do get around to doing them, which is going to be in, in February, um, and possibly uh, at people's schools as well. So there'll be, we, we shall be around doing a lot of work next year. Potentially, we could have about 16 shows going into production next year and with a whole range of other things as well. And possibly also these webinar, um, webinars we've been running during lockdown will also make a, uh, uh, will also become something, be, become part of our, um, uh, our kind of repertoire of work. So keep an eye on the, on the webinar programs as well. Do go and have a look at the Brian Hall video because I think a lot of you will find that really, really interesting. And we'll have more of that as well. So that will develop and we'll be able to launch the full thing by, by Christmas. Um, so I think that's it. Thank you very much, everybody. Stay in touch with BYMT and hopefully we'll see you uh, over the coming six months, nine months and for shows next year. Thanks very much. Bye.